were reminded when Don Donahue was talking about his Holsteins some years ago when I was buying for a client a farm property we had some Aberdeen Black Angus and by the time we got the Aberdeen Black Angus Society or whatever it is the registration headquarters in Ottawa by the time they got around to completing the transfer we had a whole new crop of calves and we had to go through the whole works again that took a year by the way the um, ministry produces a great number of booklets that your clients or you may be interested in I happen to have brought four one is called buying real estate buying a condominium, living in a condominium, and getting a second mortgage. They have many others. They've got a whole series on uh, HUDAC, what everybody should know about HUDAC, and they're in separate booklets, what the solicitor, solicitor should know, and the builder should know, and the purchaser should know, and so on, about HUDAC. But as you saw on the preliminary material, some of those topics are going to be the subject of a separate course, and I think the HUDAC course is the 13th of March, if I'm correct. Now, having heard what the purchaser is going to look for in these agreements of purchase and sale, we're going to hear from Wayne Rosenman as to why the purchaser can't have all those nice clauses and what the vendor is going to do when the vendor puts his foot down. Uh, Wayne, who's a graduate from the University of Manitoba, he tells me Brandon Campus is now its own university, then went across the country to Queens, articled in the city with a large firm and since 1972 he's been practicing with a medium to large firm heavy emphasis in real estate corporate uh, um, let me see now here was a commercial subdivisions mortgages and so on so I guess perhaps he's one of the best people we can get to tell us what to look for in this agreement of purchase and sale Wayne thank you Miriam as uh, Don has already indicated, the printed material, which will be handed out next week, deals with the topics of agreements of purchase and sale from the vendor's perspective in a general way. And tonight we propose to deal with the same points, make some of the same points by reference to the two fact situations which appear in the material and also to refer to the special issues raised by the fact situations. When Don and I first met to discuss our approach to the lectures, we thought it might be more entertaining if we were to carry out a mock negotiation. Uh, however, as you're all aware, negotiations do not take place in a vacuum, and your approach as a lawyer it has to be geared to the goals of your client. Without laying out the personal histories of the purchasers and the vendors, together with a psychological analysis of their personalities, this negotiation type of lecture is really not feasible. With Don's background, I'm sure that he could produce, if not the perfect offer from the purchaser's point of view, one that would have aspirations towards such an objective. On the other hand, as the vendor's solicitor, my preference is to have a nice, simple, unconditional offer with no representations, no warranties, oh, a 20% deposit, cash on closing, and a, th a three-day requisition period, starting on a Saturday of a long weekend. <laughs> All of this is unrealistic, and we have to take our clients as they may come to us with all their frailties of character and, regrettably, on occasion, frailties of title. While most of you have already been lectured on what you should do in the average real estate transaction, either earlier in this course or during the Lawyer's Errors and Omissions Risk Management Program, I would like to suggest that the Council of Perfection must on occasion be modified to suit your client's situation. I would hasten to add that rather than this being considered sloppy or what is worse or perhaps the same, negligent, in many respects this is the best way to serve your client and achieve his goals. When you are acting as solicitor for the vendor, you must remember your client is a vendor and vendors want to sell. Whether they are willing sellers or forced to do so through personal adversity, the objective is the same to sell the property. I regard my function as being one of making the deal and then closing the deal, or more rarely, trying to break the deal. In metropolitan Toronto at the moment, it's a vendor's market, except perhaps for the lower price condominium units. And this gives one a fair amount of scope for negotiations and to say no. Outside of Toronto, the situation depends in large respect on the area in which the house is located. 
perhaps with a group such as the one we have tonight, it is not necessary to sound this note of caution, as I understand from Miriam, most of you have been practicing for a number of years <clears throat> and by now are fully aware of the practical aspects of the practice. I am sure that all of you have had to go through lengthy negotiations with someone fresh from the bar admission course or perhaps a course such as this. And they present you with a list of precedents which they wish to insert into the agreement. And while they may make sense from his point of view, uh, they may <clears throat> make the whole offer untenable from your client's point of view. With this mild note of caution, I will review the two fact situations from the vendor's perspective. And as Don was kind enough to provide me with some of his notes, and where I've been able to write fast enough during his other comments during the lecture, I will make some reference to his comments. Dealing firstly with the rural situation, while I find the honesty of the name Cowardly Developments Limited refreshing, a numbered company or an individual in trust has about the same effect on me. The main security which I am going to receive from these people, initially at any rate, will be the deposit. At least in our situation, the purchaser has previously purchased part of the lands and so he has established some track record with us. Dealing with the description of the vendor, I would want to ensure that my executor clients do have the authority to sell the property. Uh, and I would want to confirm in the will, because based on the fact situation and the addendum, we see that uh, Mr. Fassbuck died four years ago. I would like to confirm that the will has prevented the vesting of the property into the names of the beneficiaries. Don has suggested that I should also, that he would want the widow to join in the agreement. I'd like to review or, or read a short article that uh, one of my partners, Malcolm Archibald, has produced dealing with that matter. Talking about Section 40 of the F Family Law Reform Act. He quotes it as stating, the right of a spouse to possession by virtue of subsection 1 ceases upon the, so, uh, upon the spouse ceasing to be a spouse. He goes on, in my opinion, that section means that any right of possession of the non-owning spouse terminates on the death of the owner's spouse. Accordingly, there is no need for any kind of spousal consent by the widow or widower when the personal representatives of a deceased owner's spouse is conveying the property. In dealing with the agent, you, you need to confirm that your client has, in fact, uh, listed the listing agent. Going on next to the property, initially in the fact situation, it talks about a farmhouse, barn, and outbuildings. Um, I would like to know how many outbuildings are there. Are they considered parts of the realty, or are some of them chattels? It's not unusual in a farm situation to have a outbuilding sitting on a concrete pad, and it may be that the vendor intends to take it with him, or it may be that uh, it, it has been purchased under a conditional sales contract and has not been paid in full. With respect to the legal description, the vendor solicitor has an obligation to his client to ensure that the property is fully described. Have there been any road widenings that may have taken away part of lot one? What is the full description of Lot 2? And if the description is available, it should be attached as a schedule. Um, in our case, the unregistered hydro easement and municipal drain should be included in the description. Perhaps we'll have to draw the easement on a sketch of the property if we know where the unregistered hydro easement is located. If this is not possible, then we'll just have to put it in and require the purchaser to accept it. You should ask your client, how has he calculated the 95 acres? Uh, we know that the insertion of more or less provides small comfort for small variations only, and not large variations. Does the 95 acres include the five acres that they want to sever? The facts provide that the purchaser wants a survey and is willing to pay $1,000 per acre for lands over and above the 95 acres. I would suggest that in addition to the wording of Don Surveyor's certificate, 
an addition that would give the vendor more leeway than the more or less qualification. Try for 10 acres, but settle for five, perhaps. And while I believe the, the clause indicates that extra amounts will be paid on acreage over and above the 95 acres, I would like to specify that if the total acreage is below 95 acres and within any agreed upon variation, there would be no reduction in the purchase price. As this entire agreement is conditional on financing and possibly on one with respect to the milk quota, the vendor would normally be reluctant to go to the expense of preparing a survey while the agreement is still conditional. On the other hand, in our situation, the vendor could commence his Planning Act uh, application for the severance because presumably he wants this five-acre parcel excluded in any event. Don said that I might have some comment on the deposit. I'm stuck with Miriam's facts, but I do note that the deposit represents 1.05% of the total purchase price and in my mind does not re represent much of a commitment by cowardly de developments. Perhaps I could try for a further deposit of 18000 upon satisfaction of the financing condition. The low dealing with the allocation figures that have been given with us, Don has queried the low allocation to the house, and I guess I would respond by stating that that clearly indicates that it is in a rundown condition, and so why don't we just delete all references to work orders in any event. In the facts, Miriam has suggested two conditions, and I, I note that Don, following the standard purchaser's practice, has added or suggested four more. I would want my clients to be fully aware that the failure to satisfy a condition entitles the purchaser to refuse to close the transaction. Perhaps the client would prefer the condition to be phrased in the form of a warranty or a representation with an agreed amount of damages rather than as a condition. Dealing with the conditions, firstly the financing. I share Don's view on the surprising detail of our condition on financing, um, but in any event, dealing with financing conditions, you have to consider whether the condition being proposed is reasonable in light of the current interest rates and availability of funds in order to determine if the condition is a realistic one or is merely a, an option. If it calls for a first mortgage of 90% with an interest rate of below current market value, then really all you have is an option. In our fact situation, the purchaser is looking for a mortgage that represents 79% of the value of the property, the cattle, and the equipment. That seems to me to be a high percentage, even with the collateral security. Uh, the cattle, in particular, uh, can die, unlike most land, and, and the security is not all that, that good. If I read the facts right, and the mortgage requires payments of 15000 on account of principal half yearly, by my calculations, there's nothing to renew at the end of the initial term. With respect to the survey condition, I think I'd prefer that this clause not be a condition, but rather be an obligation of the vendor to obtain within a reasonable time frame, failing which I'd give the purchaser the right to arrange for the survey with the cost to be an adjustment on closing. As the survey is required for determining the number of acres comprising the property, I would also want the survey not to have to include all of the buildings because this will increase the cost of the surveying. As Don's pointed out with respect to the Planning Act clause, this is not really a condition as the failure to obtain the severance does not entitle the purchaser to terminate the transaction, rather the purchaser pays an additional sum of money for the additional property. This is also a condition which cannot be waived by the purchaser alone. I guess when we use standard wording, we often get committed to that wording and we will pass over the usual wording that the purchaser may have the right to waive the option, to waive the conditions at its sole option. This type of condition is not one on behalf of the purchaser. 
you, I'm sure you can all think of others. If the vendors have got an offering on another house and they want it, the condition on the sale of their property states that the other property has to be accepted. Uh, I can recall when Land Speculation Tax Act was in force and it imposed sanctions on vendors where uh, if, if there was not an exemption under the act that the purchaser would be given the right to waive this clause and impose the sanction on the vendor. And, and the, the main point of mentioning this is to read the wording and not to accept the, the standard wording. See what is, it, what is intended by the situation. If I can just move back briefly to the mortgage condition. When I first read the fact situation, I was not certain uh, on what basis the interest on the mortgage was to be calculated, whether it was to be calculated annually or half yearly. I was all prepared to discuss the Ontario Court of Appeal case of Remorinish Land Developments and Metropolitan Trust Company, 1979, 23OR1, concerning the principle of deemed reinvestment of the interest payments, which results in a saving to the mortgagor if the interest is calculated annually rather than half yearly. But as of this month, this earlier decision has been reversed by the Supreme Court of Canada. And while I only have a newspaper article to base my comments on, it seems that there will be no deemed reinvestment unless the parties have agreed to do so, or perhaps if the calculation period differs from the payment period. Um, all of you may instantly think of clients who have been paying or receiving too little interest and you may want to uh, have a discussion with your former mortgagors. Dealing with the question on the conservation authority condition, uh, I would prefer that the purchaser make his own as investigation prior to signing any offer in order that it may satisfy itself as to the status of the property. Assuming that the purchaser is in fact a developer, it should know how to approach a conservation authority, and it may well be that only a small portion of the land is subject to the conservation authority's control, and this may result in quite an attractive park or ravine setting. In any event, this is something that I would want the developer purchaser to, to satisfy himself before the offer is signed. Dealing with the milk quota condition, uh, I'm not familiar with them and I'm prepared to accept everything that Don has stated with respect to them, but exercising the vendor's normal reluctance to conditions and before agreeing to the condition, I would want to know how long it takes for the board to approve the assignment. Will they deal with the application before closing? This is also the type of condition which could be modified partially to provide that if the milk quota was reduced by, say, more than the usual 15 percent, but less than 25 percent, there could be an agreed reduction in the purchase price. As a developer, I would fear that our purchaser would not have the sympathy of the board, and I would prefer, obviously, that there be no condition. Dealing with the uh, registered herd of cattle. I would want to know what type of evidence Don wants in order that I may satisfy him that the health regulations have been complied with. And I'd like this specified in the agreement. I also believe that dealing with a purchaser like Cowardly Developments, that the death of one or two or three cows should not negate the entire transaction. Uh, assuming that the purchaser is buying it for development purposes, then I would like to have some leeway. Uh, perhaps I can uh, do away with one or two cows without any abatement and then perhaps a pro rata abatement thereafter up to a maximum number. The point is there's no reason to give the purchaser an out for something that may be beyond your control if the cattle get some disease. Moving to the offers, I do have an offer here somewhere. The Ontario Ward. Oh, it's okay. Clause three is dealing with the 
the fixtures that are to be included and the list of equipment that is to be included. Excuse me. The list is often prepared by a real estate agent and uh, particularly in our case where we're dealing with an estate, uh, we would want to ensure that the client knows that they can deliver what they say they, they're going to deliver. It also appears that the widow has resided in the house for some period of time and there may will, well be some fixtures that she may want to remove, such as the chandelier in the dining room or the fireplace mantle, and the developer may not really care. Dealing with Clause 5, the March 17th closing date causes me no problem so long as the transaction was signed at the commencement of this lecture series. I have to remember that I need time to make my severance application and would at least obtain the decision of the Land Division Committee. It's unlikely we'd want it to go as long as an appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board, but just to prepare the necessary application, survey, have circulation to adjoining owners, have the decision, then circulation of, to all parties who are interested of the notice of the decision, and expiry of the appeal period can easily run two months. The addendum to the fact situation with respect to the residential lease in favor of the deceased's daughter and son-in-law creates an insurmountable problem unless an agreement can be reached with them prior to signing the offer. As the lease is for a fixed term, there is no entitlement to terminate. I have found, though, in situations where there is a month-to-month -month residential tenant, many landlords forget the security of tenure provisions currently provided to residential tenants. If there is a conversion of a use from that as a residential premise, yes, you do have the right to terminate, but the termination is not 30 days, it's not 60 days, it's 120 days. And while this is not obscure law, I've just received yesterday two offers on a development property in which there are six houses located on it, and the parties selling it to us have produced copies of leases saying, oh, we." Sure, they're residential leases, but we have a clause in there giving us a 60-day termination right in the event of sale. That's all very good. The Landlord and Tenant Act overrules those provisions. And they'll have to give 120 days. And so right now, I've got a free option. Unless they can buy out these tenants, we can take a, a free ride on this property for the 60 days up till closing. In our situation, depending on Cowardly's intentions, maybe we can negotiate a new lease for our people for a few years. I think that Miriam is also throwing us a bit of a curve with one of the executors residing in the house, and perhaps that's something that Bob Cohn will deal on with respect to requisitions. Dealing with Clause 6 and the time for, for requisitions, I'm delighted with the 10-day time period. I note that not only is it unlikely that Don will receive any replies to his request for information on work orders, it also requires that he perform his search prior to the conditions being satisfied. Uh, some clients may instruct him not to do the search until we get the financing resolved, and that will leave him in the position of having no requisition period. In Clause 9, I can accept Don's deletion of the clause dealing with registered restrictions so long as there are none in existence. If I do not know, a possible compromise is to make it a condition that any such restriction would not prevent the development of the property or the intended use by the purchaser with some limits set as to what this proposed development may be. There may be other restrictions which would not prevent this proposed development and I would not wish the agreement to be terminated in the event there was some minor unimportant restriction. If I was successful in deleting the work orders clause in clause six, then I should also delete it in clause nine. Make a brief comment on clause 11, which is the one dealing with fire insurance policies and the property remaining at the risk of the vendor. Many of us forget that when and become a slave to the standard form document. I'm acting for executors who want to sell the property. I presume that we're selling it to a developer and he doesn't really care if that house burns down. I'd like to not give him the option. I'd like to re revise this clause to provide that 
he has no obligation but to complete the closing and take the insurance proceeds obviously i have to ensure that my executor clients have maintained the insurance dealing with clause 12 being the plan the planning act clause uh, this type of clause bothers me from the vendor's point of view in the standard form it does not enable the vendor to refuse to satisfy owner's conditions which may be imposed by the committee and may make the entire transaction uneconomic uh, perhaps as a trade-off and in return for giving me the right to refuse to satisfy the conditions I can give the purchaser the option of satisfying the conditions at its expense if it so desires. Dealing with the commission clause, I think we all know that we have to change that. And I might point out that even when acting as a purchaser, I change this clause because in the event that the transaction does terminate through the agreement of the parties, I don't want a real estate agent causing difficulties in getting my deposit back. dealing now with the urban fact situation. As our vendor has remarried, perhaps this is the type of situation where the wife should join in the agreement to consent to the transaction in order that she will be committed. She hasn't had a long history with, uh, with our uh, vendor and you don't want uh, marital difficulties to result which will result in the disruption of the sale of the property. In the fact situations it indicates that there is no agent. I would want my client to tell me that there is no agent, that he has not signed any listing agreements. Some clients think that they can uh, sign an agreement with a purchaser di directly so long as the purchaser wasn't introduced to them by the agent during the currency of the listing agreement. Uh, I would also, if the client has in fact signed a listing agreement which has expired, I would want to know, has this purchaser been introduced to you during the listing agreement? And if so, was there a time limit? Uh, 60 days is the precedent shown in uh, the materials during which the agent will still be entitled to their commission. In our situation, dealing with the deposit, we do not have agents. Uh, therefore, uh, while the, I, I, I would suspect that the purchaser would not want the deposit to go directly to my client, so that next best result would be to go to the vendor solicitors. In my view, I think the deposit, so long as the size warrants, should always be put in an interest-bearing account. Uh, even if the purchaser is to get the benefit of the interest, at least it, it increases your security as vendor. Uh, I, was, I was recently involved in settling an action over a real estate agreement that was signed in 1965 and never completed. For 15 years, the agent held the deposit in its trust account without any interest accruing. And as the settlement resulted in both the vendor and purchaser receiving one half of the deposit, both parties suffered as the interest would have more than doubled the deposit during this time. dealing with clause two and Don's suggestion that the adjustments take place in the cash on closing rather than the um, mortgage back. Um, as long as there does not appear to be any major adjustments, I can, as a vendor, I can agree with this. However, if I'm successful in getting perhaps a number of the clauses inserted, uh, providing for abatement of purchase price in the event of the death of one or more of the cattle, or some of those other similar reductions or whether the purchaser has to pay for the survey, the cash on closing could vary substantially. And if our people are relying on this cash on closing uh, to purchase another house, it's not our fact situation here, but it is often the case, then I don't want that, that cash being reduced. I agree with Don's comments on the, on the mortgage expressing it to be no more than 16 percent. Uh, uh, certainly the vendor intends it to, it to be no less than 16 percent. Don suggested a condition respecting the swimming pool. Uh, obviously I would prefer to have no condition with respect to the swimming pool 
and would suggest to the purchaser that, as with the second story apartment, so long as he does not make any request to municipal officials, the existing situation would probably not be affected. The fencing requirements for the pool is purely a cost item, and I guess I would argue my sale price does not include new fences, and the purchaser would argue that his sale price does not, purchase price does not include it. Dealing with the condition on inspections, uh, if this is to be a preliminary condition requiring an inspection of the property by a contractor, um, I'd want some revisions in that. I think that I would want the person making the inspection report to be an independent third party and have some qualifications for doing so. In addition, uh, even with a relatively new house as the one we have here, anyone can find defects to reasonable wear and tear. And I would attempt to tie any condition on inspection report down to, say, major, major structural defects. And I would define major as being any matter that would cost more than 5000 to remedy. I would also insist that the vendor receive a copy of the report in order that we can review it and to determine whether or not it is valid. While I do not like the inspection 24 hours prior to closing, I have been involved in several instances where vendors have removed lighting fixtures, wall paneling, and built-in mirrors. They've replaced doors, chandeliers, and doorbells with inferior quality items. And as the current prize winner of my own personal award for disreputable vendors, there was one vendor who very carefully removed every second brass screw from all of the cabinetry in the kitchen and bathroom. And he didn't even bother to replace them. In my view, such acts are clearly fraudulent and the purchaser's remedies would not merge on closing, although there is always the problem of costs involved. Dealing with the Clause 3 and the suggested insertion of the rose bushes and the elm tree, I guess I'm concerned that there may be a warranty that it's going to be alive and with winter kill, etc., I'm not sure I can guarantee that. The facts say that there's a TV antenna as well as a cable TV. And therefore, I may want to expressly exclude any representation that the antenna is still in working order as our client probably hasn't used it recently. Dealing with the firewood, I had one transaction that almost fell apart as a result of a series of disputes, one of which included the amount of firewood stored in the garage. Um, while I suppose by having a reference to storage in the garage, there's a limit on the number of firewood, can't be any more than the garage full, I would prefer a bit more precision. If it's a bit cold, maybe the vendor's going to use the fire between now, firewood between now and closing. Dealing with Clause 5, uh, if the purchaser is prepared to accept an illegal tenancy, I think you have to clarify and change this clause to make it clear that uh, vacant possession will not be given, insert the details of the tenancy, then in clause six, indicate that the present use, um, change the wording about be it being lawfully continued. Even if the zoning permits multiple family uses, the house may not have been built to comply with the zoning requirements or there may not be sufficient parking. Looking at clause 9, which requires that the purchaser agree to assume any restrictions so long as they are complied with, uh, as this is a new house, presumably there is a fairly recent subdivision agreement on it and some developers are better than, other, than others in replying to your requests for acknowledgments that you have complied. And if there is any concern in your mind, then perhaps you can insert a clause requiring that the purchaser accept a declaration by the vendor as to such compliance. Looking at clause six, if the tenancy is to be assumed, often with residential tenants, uh, you will find that the rent is habitually late by a week or two. And I would like to modify this clause to provide that we will have an adjustment for at least up to one month in arrears. In looking at the various fact situations, it does not seem that Miriam has presented me as a vendor with the difficulty of obtaining a discharge of any mortgages. 
you're all aware of the cases on that and the difficulties caused by the inability to have discharges available on closing. Um, both Don and I have suggested that in Toronto at any rate, you uh, have a direction re authorizing sufficient funds from the closing proceeds be made payable directly to the mortgagee. You provide a mortgage statement setting out the amount required to discharge and you give certain undertakings by your firm limited to um, getting these funds delivered to the mortgage company and uh, pursuing the matter in that respect and you can give an unqualified undertaking by your client to proceed and obtain such a discharge at some point. Um, unfortunately many mortgage companies will put at the bottom of their mortgage statement those little letters E and O E and if they do make an error they may demand more money and then the check is made out for and uh, they, many mortgage companies will fight tooth and nail when you ask them to please check, double check your records, tell us what's owing so we know. Uh, they will insist on leaving that, although I've had some mortgage companies that will accept a separate indemnification from the vendors agreeing that if there was an error they will make good the error. If you can't succeed in deleting the E and OE and the purchaser solicitors won't agree with this procedure, then you have to look into prepaying the mortgage prior to closing and uh, having the discharge available. Well, you may read the um, printed materials at your leisure, I, uh, and I do recommend the articles referred to at the end of my materials. I hope that the uh, method of reviewing the fact situation in detail during the lecture has been of value, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Mary? Thank you very much, Wayne. I'm, I think it kind of would have been fun if we could have had the two of them uh, working on the agreements at the same time we could hear the battle of the minds. If there are any questions that you do have with respect to the um, evening's discussion, the uh, lecturers have agreed to answer some of your questions. Just before we get into that, could I just remind you, if you, uh, we, we've heard this evening, get your client to confirm. If you look at page 28, you'll see the frame of a kind of letter that you would get from your client. There was also some mention of the description of the property, the, the urban property, and you will recall you got a handout last week that was the sketch, but it's already in your book at page 100. And let's see now what we have in the way of questions. Are there any? There's one question over here. The questioner wants Wayne to talk about the 120-day notice for your tenant. Wayne? Um, I'm aware of one uh, decision which, to my knowledge, hasn't been overruled, indicating that a sale of the property would be sufficient grounds for giving such a 120-day notice period. Um, but I think that the basis that you would be giving such a, a notice is on the basis that you are converting the premises to a use other than residential premises, uh, whether it be owner-occupied or whether it's for the purposes of demolition for conversion to a commercial use. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> yes, I will. We have another question at the back. Does the purchaser have sufficient interest, assuming the agreement has been signed, to, but to give the tenant notice before to be directed to a time before closing? Can he give notice before closing to a tenant that will be effective after closing? Wayne, do you want to try that one? I don't believe that he can, although I know that there's been some discussion on this type of provision. Maybe Don has. I have no answer. 
As solicitor to the purchaser, Don declines to answer that one. Any others? If you have any others, by the way, and we don't get to them tonight, be sure you write them out. I see one, second row from the end. The, the questioner asks if the re reference in the commission clause on the back page of the offer saying I irrevocably instruct my solicitor to pay, whether that obliges the solicitor, and I know Don wants to answer this one. The clause annoys me, as I'm sure it does you, and um, I usually get around it by not getting the money. And then uh, let the agent collect his own fees. We have to collect ours. Um, I know it is a direction, but if I don't get the money, I can't do it. I think if I do get the money, I, I guess I have to pay them. But usually I let the money go straight through and let the agent find his own. I don't know of any cases on this. I've never heard of an agent suing a lawyer uh, on that direction. Um, I guess you have to do it. Well, but it's a, well, he is a party, the, well, he's named it, he doesn't sign it, I know, but it is a direction by my client telling me what to do with his money, and normally we do obey our client's directions, and it's a written direction signed by my client, so I, I think I should follow it if I have the money, but if the money never gets into my hands, then I don't think I have to, uh, well, I can't comply then. Just on that point, could I draw to your attention the agreement of purchase and sale, the one that is the urban one, page seven. There is no agent there, and there are four places you have to doctor an offer that has a no agent. One is on the third line where it says agent. The next is in paragraph one, uh, where uh, we've already had mentioned that it's payable to someone else, probably the vendor's solicitor. The third place is in paragraph nine, the second line from the bottom, the vendor's agent shall be not, not be liable for costs and damages. And the last one is in your commission clause, and sometimes you will want to put there, the undersigned accepts the above offer and acknowledges receipt by his solicitor, or whoever it happens to be, of the deposit. And I think I saw one more question. Yes? Questioner wants to know, how do you go about establishing the value of the chattels in the agreement of purchase and sale? Because the parties probably haven't addressed their minds to the problem. And you're quite correct, they probably haven't addressed their minds to the problem. If you get the offer in advance, you will try and direct their minds. In residential, chances are there's no commercial value and the nominal value is a very nominal value. Let your part, my advice to the parties is to let them decide, the purchaser is the one that really has to make the decision because he swears the affidavit and he pays the retail sales tax. Am I putting myself as solicitor in a position to be in violation of the Retail Sales Act? Not if I stay out of the act. I am to give them advice, they make the decision, they agree or the purchaser states his figure and swears the affidavit. And I, won't, I only want to be on record as having told him that he must think about this. And, you know, not defraud the taxing authorities. Anything else? Well, I guess in that case then, we'll all hang in for a week. I'm anxious to see what's going to happen when we get to requisitions. Anybody think about Dower for Irma?